Good morning. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Guy Johnson alongside Kriti Kupta. And today, Tom McKenzie. Anna is out today. Uh, we got about an hour until we get into cash trading here in Europe. It's going to be a busy day. What do you need to know? OK, first off, let's start with US futures and European futures. Equity futures are higher after Friday's substantial sell-off. Investors now face a big week of corporate earnings that includes, well, most of the Magnificent Seven and a raft of European banks. Tesla has spent the weekend cutting prices. Elon Musk has postponed a trip to India. Volkswagen employees in Tennessee voting to unionize. We're going to talk about what's happening in the car sector and... The U.S. House passes aid packages for Ukraine, for Israel and for Taiwan. And it bolts on a bill that will force ByteDance to divest or sell TikTok. Pretty. In the meantime, a quick check on the markets. Eurostock 50 futures higher by five tenths of one percent, perhaps a little bit of a rebound from what we saw in Friday's session. The 10-year yield at 464. You were seeing a yield higher, about three to four basis points intraday. Euro dollar 106. Cable at 123 as we continue to talk about dollar strength. Markets today starts right now. Monday, the 22nd of April. We've got a massive week coming up, folks, in terms of the earnings story. But first, I think we just need to spend a moment thinking about what happened Friday and into the weekend. Friday, obviously, massive day. Risk off. We did see a significant sell-off uh, in the tech sector. The Nasdaq was down really hard. Futures, as Critty has already been saying, indicating that we are going to see a bounce back this morning. But I suspect, guys, that we are going to see a bumpy ride this week. We certainly are. It feels like it's a make or break, except I feel like we said this last earnings cycle yep. as well, whereas this big tech story was going to be the canary in the coal mine, especially when we talk about U.S. consumer resilience, the kind of read through into the bottom line, supply chain costs, and ended up being a giant nothing burger. And I'm wondering if this week is a lot of the same. The setup feels a little bit different. The market feels much more jittery going into this. So it's yeah. going to be interesting to see kind of which catalyst this week we focus on maybe to drive the market story. And there are a lot of them, Tom. I mean, NVIDIA was remarkable, wasn't it, as a reminder, whether or not that's an opening for investors, given yep. the 10% drop on, on Friday, and the fact that valuations, multiples now for that, for that company, will be looking a little bit more attractive. But yes, that's clearly, that's going to be one component, isn't it, the catalyst, and whether that catalytic effect from AI kind of filters through. I think Tesla is looking pretty concerning, isn't it, um, on, on Tuesday. But I'm going to unpack that story in more detail um, throughout these next few hours. Taylor Swift. Out with a new album, though, just to make us feel better over the weekend. I love that so. you're bringing uh, T Swift into, into the mix. Well, she's about to start a, about to start a tour. He is here our in Europe. Taylor Swift correspondent, don't you know? It, it, it's, a, it's a title that I like to hold. I have tickets. I'm looking forward I to know. going. Yeah. August. Um, taking my wife. It's, the, I know the economics fascinate you as well. And you've been, you've been listening back to back songs all through yeah. the weekend, um, singing. Uh, to, to your, your neighbour's much uh, grievance, but, but, but uh, belting out the tunes. And you're going to do that at the end of the show for us. Um, but the economics interest you as well, Guy. They, they do. She has a really big effect. And it's interesting at a time when we've seen, I think, the, sort of the, the economic effects in the United States. She's about to start touring here in Europe. Are we going to see an impact on the European data? But let's talk a little bit about... Critty wants to talk about Enrique. We'll, we'll do that. Maybe. I was so ready. I had so many <laughs> funny things to say. Fine. It's fine. Talk about he the news. He does children's parties now, doesn't he? Something like that. You well, are so mean. Here's what he's to watch out for this week, then. An aggravated wow. Kriti Gupta. Um, but also, on Monday, earnings from Verizon. SAP earnings and uh, the software space. That's going to be interesting, potentially, uh, for Germany, of course, listed in Germany. And EU foreign ministers uh, meeting their reaction, uh, potentially, to that funding that seems to be coming through from the US for Ukraine. Tuesday, Euro area PMIs. We've been hearing from Chancellor Schultz and others. The IMF suggesting that maybe the European economy is starting to, to turn around a little bit, German economy. And those Tesla earnings are going to be really, really fascinating on Tuesday, along with GM earnings as well. Wednesday, uh, the ECB speakers, including Schnabel, and others, we're going to get Boeing, Meta, IBM earnings, and Thursday, European bank earnings, uh, including the likes of DB, uh, Swedbank, there's a whole list, and then US tech earnings story you, as well. To read there's here. a lot to go through. <laughs> Maybe you should jump in. The BOJ is going to do their thing on Friday. It's a live meeting. They're not expected to move, but still very interesting given what's happening with the end. Um, what, 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 for, what for you is the most I I interesting earnings part of the story then that you're going to be focused on? I think Tom needs a rest after. after yes, catch his breath. That. And breathe. <laughs> There's a lot going. I think I think tech after the sell-off Friday. I think tech's got a lot to deliver on. Um, in some ways, though, I think it's interesting that actually it's the rest of the market where we're expected to see earnings actually faltering. It's big yeah. tech that, if you look at the numbers that analysts are generating, 
is likely to actually be one of the more positive pictures. Mm. There is a macro rate through here because as we're talking about kind of the sell-off that we're seeing, I've got the S&P 500 kind of uh, pulled up on my screen here, 6% drop from its peaks. We wait for these corrections yep. at least once a year. A pullback of, you know, 5% at least two to three times a year is very normal. How much of this is simply just a retracement of what we're seeing? Is this something that at the 10% level you see a big bid back into as opposed to a reaction of, is this the U.S. consumer winding down? Is this investment in AI or cloud winding down as opposed to simply plumbing? And that's why I think perhaps the fundamentals, this is just one theory, may not matter as much to the likes of Microsoft, Alphabet, Tesla, from a more macro standpoint as they may have, say, three or six months ago. Do you ago. feel that the macro is quite negative right now? The market is having to deal with a strong dollar, elevated oil prices. Uh, it's having to deal with, and, and it's a really big week for issuance as well, yeah. higher yields uh, that we're having to factor in as well. The earnings story feels like it's one of the few planks that are still supporting maybe the equity market. And if that doesn't deliver and you remove that, Kind of, is there is there anything really is is there anything that's going to support this market and could six percent just be the beginning of it? Like we've had a very strong run up this year. If the CTAs etc. start trailing, trending on the downside and momentum turns, yeah. how much could you see as, as as the drop being? You know, I'll 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 argue the counter of that, which sure. is which is I actually don't think it's very doomsday at all, to be honest. In fact, it, it, I think because we've seen so much optimism, because we're talking about the consumer resilience story, it's actually been taken in stride. Even the fact we had rate cuts pushed out to yep. 2025, the markets, yes, they sold, but they didn't sell off that much. You would think that another, even talk about a hike, would sell off the market more. You're seeing more volatility in the bond space in the stock market, and we talk about this over and over again. If you see a yield of 5%, does that hit the bottom line of some of these big tech companies? And yet we're creeping closer and closer to it, and you're not seeing as kind of a volatile or violent response, especially in big tech, as you have seen previously. And how much cash is still sitting on the sidelines with those? You can clip a coupon of 5% or above, right, given, given where the two-year yep. is right now. And so is that, is that a headwind for equities, the fact that you're keeping more money in money markets, or is that potential dry powder that's going to be put to play when you, when you get some clarity? But to your, to your point, Guy, it's really interesting when you read some of the analysis, like, well, yes, central banks, high, high for longer, yes, there's a geopolitical, but, but, you know, the earnings will come through. There seems to be a yeah. desperation so, from some of the These are sell-side notes you're reading, yeah? Uh, they, 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 <laughs> may, they may well be, yes. <laughs> um, so it's a big week yeah. it, 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 in terms of the, the earnings story, but the geopolitics is... Absolutely front and centre as well. And I think that's going to be a feature of the landscape that we're going to need to, to pay attention to. We, we can't ignore what's happening here in Europe. The banks are going to be reporting. Mm -hmm. What is it, Thursday? We get BMP, yeah. we get Barclays. That's going to be um, really important, I think. Uh, there's another bank, Deutsche. Deutsche yeah. is going to be reporting that day as well. So there's some really big... And we're kind of starting the European earnings season in earnest this week. And, and again, there's, there's a lot of people saying... The U.S. has got too expensive. Do I buy Europe? Does that go into reverse? If the, Europe, if the U.S. market gets cheaper, does that kind of, oh, buy Europe, start to fade a little bit? In theory, right, especially when so many corporates are kind of relying on that U.S. consumer resilience story and it hasn't fully baked through. I think the banks are different, though, and this, well, that's why I'm kind of excited for Thursday for, for the very first time so. about European yeah. banks. Um, well, because I just think it's, it's so different. You, you approach European banks so differently, and I think at a time when it's quite clear that kind of peak net interest margins are, are perhaps in the rearview mirror, how are Barclays, Deutsche, um, and BMP, among others, dealing with the fact that you don't have the capital markets kind of uh, churn that's kind of helping propel some of the Goldmans, the JP yeah. Morgans of the world. You don't have that dynamic here in Europe to kind of help the earnings up more. Uh, Barclays does have it to a certain extent. Big, decent-sized U.S. footprint and a lot of traders. Deutsche has traditionally been quite strong in FIC. So I'm interested to see, because Deutsche, uh, sorry, GS did very well in, in fixed yeah. income. I'm wondering if there's some sort of translation effect into Deutsche. You have to rely on the volatility of the bond market, right? Like, these are market makers at the end of the day. So if you are seeing uh, good numbers come out of Deutsche Bank on, on, on FIC, it's a, oh, well, this is the market volatility. But if you see bad numbers, it's why aren't they capitalizing on the market volatility? Mm. And here in the UK, we're going to get NatWest as well, so a bit of a taste. Friday, in terms isn't of, it? That's Friday as well, so a bit of a gauge in terms of, in terms of arguably the property sector here. Yep. Um, expect, you know, and you tie that to the view around the BOE, sounding a little dovish. Um, but the net interest margin story, of course, um, salient as well for, for NatWest um, as, as we weigh up what happens with, with their counterparts cool, in cool, Europe. Cool PCE coming up on Friday. The Fed's going into a quiet period, I think, yeah. uh, on the 2nd, so we'll, we'll get less Fed speak. Um, few. Um, <laughs> we've got quite a lot of ECB speak this week, but, yeah. but less Fed speak coming up. So pretty good for this weekend. Do you think she was listening to Taylor Swift or Enrique? Uh, did she have to turn it off to listen to what was happening in the House of Representatives? Oh, I like that segue. Um, <laughs> it was a, 
Or do if you call him or, or Enrico, Tom. It's a weird one, isn't it? <laughs> I will walk out the side. Taylor Swift and some other guy. So what, I can't, what was I really can't. happening in terms of the policy? Look, this, this is really, really consequential, obviously. And Absolutely. What, what an about turn as, as well for Speaker, Speaker Johnson, whose now you know, job is arguably on the line. Um, he was picked by, by, the, by the, the hard right originally. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's had this kind of shift in his view in terms of whether or not you need support for Ukraine. And ultimately, come, come around to that after, it seems, um, in-depth briefings from, from intelligence agencies. This is consequential, though, for Ukraine. This is enormous for Ukraine, for Israel, for Gaza, for yep. Taiwan, for other Indo-Pacific allies, even Iran. There is so much baked into this bill. On the surface, I'm going to rant here for a second. On the surface, ninety-five sorry. billion dollars. You know what? It's better on the USA than Enrico uh, or Enrique. <laughs> Enrique so sorry. Oh this is this is what's <laughs> happened when you spend time with Tom and Guy. I can't do it. Ninety-five billion dollars of aid going yep. to Ukraine, going to uh, Israel, going to Taiwan. A lot of this is defense replenishments. This is a really big deal, especially for Israel uh, or the Israeli part of the aid, which is about getting about $26 billion, $9 billion of which is just for humanitarian assistance in Gaza. And the wording is really important here because you're also seeing the same kind of wording, again, very specifically in the Taiwan picture as well, about $8 billion. You can see it on the screen right now, the breakdown of the aid overwhelmingly for Ukraine. But a lot of that is simply just replenishment for defense as we start to see kind of the Russian... Uh, offensive gained a little bit more ground in Ukraine. Perhaps it's getting pulled back. But remember, it comes out of really big delay. So there are questions about the effectiveness of this. The other pieces of this bill, or kind of the bolt-ons, you mentioned in the headlines as well, is broader Iranian sanctions, this divestiture now for TikTok that's being yep. potentially signed into law by the end of this week, that coincides with Antony Blinken's trip to Beijing. This is not going to look great if you see, by the end of the week, President Biden signing this bill into law while also trying to forge some sort of element of diplomacy with China. That, to me, feels like quite a bit of a churn. And I, I just think this is really important because we see these $95 billion of aid come through, but it's the sanction story, it's the uh, kind of defense story underneath, the security <laughs> bills that I think are more market moving. Well, and another part of the... Of the or the, the rationale for Blinken being in China is to pressure them in terms of some of the components that you're getting to, to Russian missile systems and, and defence equipment there as well. So that's, that's, that's part of it. Um, I, the, the, the China, in election years, they know that they become the whipping boy of, of, of US elections. So there'll be yeah. some, some of it will be kind of reverting to, the, reverting to the mean in terms of their response to that. Yeah. Um, but continuing to monitor that, obviously, re really interesting. And TikTok, what, 170 million um, users? It's the algorithm, and China has its own laws around the algorithm of ByteDance that that is going to come down is going to come down to whether or not the US gets access to that China will not want them to get access to that algorithm they've got laws in place to stop that so what happens they, from a Chinese point of view how do they play this yeah. one they uh, ultimately they would pref they would be willing uh, to to sacrifice TikTok on the altar of their own national security there's no doubt about that so they will implement those laws so they a ban comes into force at that point, they would. I, I would find it very hard to see how China allows that algorithm developed in China to be opened up to security services in the U.S. to ensure that the company continues to operate in the U.S. I'd find that very difficult to see. It's going to be an interesting one. There's also another element of the China story to the Iranian sanctions that are getting broadened out as well. This is again a broadening out. We're talking about vessels, ports, etc., now being targeted. There's also a piece of this national security bill that specifically talks about Chinese banks, Chinese financial institutions and an infrastructure that helps support Iranian funding in terms of oil. So this is actively targeting kind of not only the supply chain for Iranian oil, but also the funding, which a lot of it comes from China as well. And I thought that was interesting in terms of the wording of the bill. I just find it amazing that we're putting all of this together in one sort of set of, sort of larger set of legislation. Um, and, and bipartisan that, too. And, and so I'm assuming, that part, when, is the, when is the Senate vote? Tuesday? Senate vote is tomorrow. So I'm assuming yeah. it goes through. It is largely expected to go through, yeah. signed into law by Biden on Thursday, if mm. all goes well. OK. We're gonna, <laughs> that's going to be a story this week. We'll see exactly how the Chinese respond to that. Um, futures are currently fairly positive. It is Passover, so just keep an eye on what happens with the volume uh, a little bit later on. So we'll have to factor that into our thinking. Coming up, Tesla cutting prices again. Elon Musk postponing his trip to India. We're going to bring you more on the EV space. We're going to talk more about what's happening with the wider sector as well. Big Capital Markets Day this week for Volkswagen. We'll talk more about Volkswagen as well. Plus, King Dollar. Could May start uh, to become, could this become a big burden uh, on EM currencies? I think it probably already is. We're going to dive into FX markets later this hour. Plus, up next, the Magnificent Seven begin reporting. Uh, we saw that Nasdaq sell off Friday. What's next for equities? We're going to, go to talk about what happens with tech. We're going to talk about what happens with oil. We're going to talk about what happens with the banks.
We've got some great guests lined up. You want to join in our conversation? You want to talk about Taylor Swift versus Enrique? You want to talk about the markets? You want to talk about whatever? IB Plus TV Go. That's the function you need to use. This is Bloomberg. hearing it's all big tech, right? That's what some of the headlines are this quarter is about big tech. Big tech has great balance sheets with a lot of cash and very little debt. Mega cap tech companies that are generating extraordinary amounts of cash flow, they're still actually doing very well. Tech is a big part of the quality story. And we still would expect for this quarter in particular for many of those companies to lead on earnings growth. If you look going out, you know, one, two, three quarters, I mean, it is going to start broadening out. You can't have tech be the only thing that does well if you're starting to see economic weakness in other places. We're just ramping up earnings season now and I think that's going to be a good distraction um, for the market to be able to sort of have a look what's actually going on to see whether the lofty valuations are actually supported by the fundamentals. Yes, it's a big week for big tech and we saw a big sell-off on Friday. How does that change the story going into this week? Let's try and figure that one out. A few interesting things you want to know. Exxon's now worth more than uh, Tesla. That's the first time that's happened uh, for really quite a while. The Magnificent Seven, uh, absolutely front and centre this week. Uh, and in terms of what we're expecting from the earnings portion, it is expected that actually big tech delivers. The rest of the market, maybe not so much. Cole Smead, CEO and Portfolio Manager at Smead Capital Markets, joins us now from Phoenix, where it is, I think it's quarter past 11 in the evening. So... Cole, appreciate you staying up for us. Um, you and I have yeah. spoken many times over the last few years. I know you like banks. I know you like the oil sector. Cole, how much would yeah. big tech have to sell off for Cole Smead to like big tech? It's a great question, and, and uh, thanks for letting me join you this morning, Guy. Um, how I think about that is really, I mean, it's a kind of a depressing subject to get to. Uh, we've, we've looked back at this from a historical perspective to ask that question I think the most analogous time in U.S. market history that we're seeing to uh, effectively the Magnificent Seven is the Nifty 50. Okay? And the issue becomes, uh, at what price would you pay? And the problem is these businesses, like all those clips you just ran, they have wonderful balance sheets. They produce very high returns on capital. The issue is, how do you compound your money on those high returns on equity with these multiples? And that's our issue. So I just say, broadly speaking, most of these quality names, I mean, it would take a 30 to 50 percent decline, uh, at, you know, kind of at a minimum, depending on the name. I mean, just to give you a sense, go, not that long ago, uh, you know, names like DocuSign were held up in this conversation, guy. And I think we all go look yeah. back; those super high-quality growers like DocuSign, I think they're at uh, 50, you know, 15 percent of their prior high in their market cap. D Disney was part of the Nifty 50 guy; it went down 80 percent. And so we're we're kind of set up for. You know, we think there's going to be a 30 to 40 percent bear market at a bare minimum out of the S&P. And we think forward returns of the S&P over the next decade look like zero. And I might be slightly optimistic on that number when you include dividends reinvested. How does the rest of the world look in that kind of environment, Cole? I, people are holding up Europe as being the place you only want to put your money right now. The U.S. has been so elevated, you want to look elsewhere in the world. W what do you think about that narrative um, in light of what you just said in terms of your expectations for what happens in the U.S.? Yeah, <clears throat> I think the drunk monkey could take a dart and throw it at the world map, and as long as he doesn't hit the United States, he'll beat the S&P 500 from, a, from an index perspective. That's, you know, this, like Buffett and Munger have said, the secret to life's weak competition. And, I, you know, just to give you a sense of how eponymous the U.S. setup is, Guy, this reminds us of, this reminds us of Japan in 89, the tech bubble in 99, Chinese stocks in 2010. This is not like, oh, we could have a little problem. This could be a whopper of a problem. And I think the most dangerous thing that we're looking at is what if we wake up on a 10-year Treasury over 5 percent going towards 6 where long-term inflation expectations have moved in market prices and, you know, the world asks the question, you know, is the Fed in control of this? Because government spending, if you go look at interest rate, uh, interest service, uh, like Neil Ferguson, yeah. Neil Ferguson was writing over the weekend for Bloomberg Opinion, I mean, he's spot on. And I would add one more thing. Peace dividend is deflationary. Um, a war problem is inflationary. And people are very slow to react to what's going on globally, as Ferguson wrote. Cole, it's Creedy in London. 
historically, and, and I love that you brought up the Nifty 50 in particular, historically, when you look at that kind of growth picture at that time, uh, well, I want to bring it back to the war piece in a second, that move that you saw in the Nifty 50 was baked into kind of this big tech idea really being treated as a value play at its core. where so you saw Exxon, IBM, Disney, even Walmart, to your point, there are folks like Warren Buffett, for example, among others, who have looked at big tech like Apple as a value play, given simply that they are very exposed to the consumer cyclicality as opposed to kind of a more defensive play. What do you say to that in terms of the likes of Apple, for example, or even Alphabet, which is so correlated to advertising spend and that cyclicality in the business investment space being a value play? You got to remember, it's been a, quite a long time since Buffett bought that stake now. He's, he's owned that, you know, for, I want to say, about seven years. So it's not like he just woke up yesterday and said, oh, it's a great value play. Um, you know, they have sold some marginal stock in Apple. Buffett reminds me of a lot of old, wealthy people. They hate paying taxes when they've made a lot of money. And that's an, that's an externality that he has to think about as an owner of that business. So, I, you know, I, if, I'm, if I was Buffett's investment advisor, I'd be telling him it reminds me of Coke and Gillette in 98 when he called those the inevitables. And he later came back five years later and said, hey, I should have been selling those stocks at the time. So when, when Buffett oozes and, and gushes on a company, he, just like any of us, when we're willing to brag about a stock, we probably should be selling it. And so I, I, that's what I think Buffett should be doing. Do I think he's going to do that? Probably not. The, question, the real question in Berkshire's case is, you know, can his cash stake overcome how much they own in Apple? Um, again, that's his problem. We, you know, when you look back at the Nifty 50, um, broadly speaking, they all lost. There was anomalies like Coca-Cola was one of the Nifty 50 stocks that did well. Disney did well. And if, if I remember correctly, Philip Morris was the third that, that compounded. Philip Morris was the best, by the way, the old cigarettes, right? So I, you know, looking back, <laughs> at the top of markets, people are always bullish at the top. You have to have that. They're all long-term investors. Like Siegel said, you almost beat the S&P the following 25 years. The problem is I live in the real world. If I almost beat the, the S&P in 25 years, I'd be fired and out of a job. So, again, that works in academia mm. or in theory. That doesn't work Cole. in the real world. And I think we're <clears> going to prove that, you know, front and center. Cole, we need to get a meme made up with the drunken monkey uh, throwing the dark globe anywhere but the U.S. I mean, a lot of people are going to be scratching their heads over that call, Cole. Where do you land regionally? There has to be a geography that stands out to you. And what within that geography, which sector is looking appealing for you? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, I mean, we, in our international fund, we own a lot of Canada. Um, just because they're the redheaded stepchild of North America. And you can buy similar returns on equity in businesses there. And because they're not American, they don't have as much liquidity and they, you don't pay as much for them. Um, we're broadly invested in Europe in that fund, too. Um, we really liked European banks. Did you guys see any banks disappear in Europe in the last 18 months? The answer is no, because the mania sits in the United States. Um, I, people don't understand how much money has been made in European banking. Our largest holding is Unicredit. Um, you know, to your discussion earlier, I think the thing I'm most mm. interested in this week is what does Barclays do with their buybacks? Because the Unicredit playbook says buy as much stock as you possibly can at depressed valuations like Barclay, uh, Bar Barclays could do. We don't own the stock, but that's what we've been looking for in the European mm. banks. You know, we don't own anything in Japan, not because Japan's not cheaper than the United States. Yeah. The difference is their okay. buybacks aren't big there. Cole, always colourful. We appreciate your time. Running short of time. Cole Smead, CEO and Portfolio Manager at Smead Capital Management. Plenty more coming up with a focus on the greenback. This is Bloomberg. Everybody's trying to get the genie back into the bottle. There's still a risk that there's going to be an escalation here, and that's what the White House obviously does not want to see. The United States is ha, has given conflicting signals for the last three-plus years, and that's taken a toll on its ability to affect events in the Middle East, frankly. The Middle East is the least important it's been in, the, in 50 years. There is a little bit of geopolitical risk premium built into oil prices. In the 70s, the problem was the oil shock and oil prices quadruple. That's not going to happen today. If there is a serious escalation, which means a much more wider regional escalation than what we've seen so far, then yes, we could have a severe oil shock. But we're not there yet. Bloomberg TV guest on the tensions between Israel and Iran, its potential impact on oil prices, and really the general <clears throat> risk-off tone that you were seeing in markets 
Uh, guys, one of the issues in this market arguably has been complacency when it comes to geopolitical risk yeah. and what the go-to kind of bid is there. If you're not seeing it in oil, when you've seen tiny moves in oil, but not big ones to really justify that geopolitical risk premium, what do you do? Do you buy gold? Do you buy the dollar? Do you buy Swissy, yen? What's the move? So there's a really interesting piece on the terminal this morning. J.P. Barnett and Michael Masika have written it, talking about the fact that actually equity markets thus far have absorbed geopolitical risk surprisingly well. Yeah. But at some point that will crack. And maybe we aren't yet at the point where you need to make that trade or maybe you need to make it in advance of it. So if you're thinking about the geopolitical story, you're looking at equity markets, they're holding up, OK, yeah, we saw a big day Friday. But what happens next? Kind of how much more can we take? Another big kind of escalation along the curve? How do equity markets does, does react the, to that? Does the crack to infla uh, equity markets come from the inflation risk then around okay. geopolitics? Is that, is that where we zero in as the, as the potential impact for equities or is it something else? I think there's a number of transmission mechanisms here. Yeah. One would be, most, the most notable would obviously be inflation, I think. That mm. certainly seems to be the fear at the moment, mm. that geopolitics, Cole was talking about a moment ago, geopolitics tends to lead to, wars tend to be inflationary. And that would be certainly the narrative. We've already seen what happens with the snarl-ups in the supply side. If those were to persist, is that the transmission mechanism into equity markets? Or is it consumer confidence? Is it, I can't, I, there, there are a number of different vectors you could look at here. Well, wars tend to be inflationary, but that's from a supply side perspective, yep. right? They also be a great mechanism for growth as well. And, and I don't mean that in terms of being pro-war, for example, but in yep. terms of history when you've seen a history yeah. says, you, you see this kind of defense manufacturing buildup that really helps a lot of CapEx spend, a lot of investor spend, not even the, even the bond market gets uh, kind of excited about it. Uh, even Fed, the Federal Reserve and central banks, they don't hike in the face of geopolitical conflict, which in itself is a tailwind, even when there is inflation on the docket. The one thing people have been doing thus far, though, is buying the dollar. They have. Um, and, and that certainly seems to be the, the sort of safety trade right now. And everybody's trying to figure out exactly how you position yourself around this geopolitical story. So yeah. there's some, some front running. Equity market may not have absorbed it completely yet, but yeah. look at gold, as we were just mentioning, gold, dollar. Uh, and the dollar, I, what, where are we now? Well, let's take a look at the positioning that you were just mentioning. We've got a great chart on the Bloomberg Terminal. You can find it on GTV Go. But it really illustrates what Guy's just talking about, this positioning story. And we know that people have been positioned the long dollar for a while now. But more so recently, you've actually seen those bets on that bullish dollar surge. A lot of that's coming from this kind of higher for longer narrative, the fact that cuts are getting pushed out into really 2025. At least that's the consensus view by the markets in the, mo in the moment not everyone shares that view, though. Let's bring in a contrarian, if we will. Chris Turner, global head of markets over at ING, joins us this morning. You don't think that the Fed is going to wait till 2025 for that cut. Explain. Yeah, you know, we've got um, at ING, we've got three cuts from the Fed starting in kind of September. And um, we think there are signs that the hard sector data does catch up with the survey data and that the Fed will be in a position through the disinflation to, to cut three times uh, later this year. So... It's not going to happen kind of this, this quarter, and I think market sentiment stays pretty strong for, for the U.S. during kind of this quarter. But I think in Q3, we expect the environment to turn. And uh, where the market's pricing today, the market's only pricing one and a half Fed rate cuts for the moment. So we think that pricing will probably start to shift, favoring more rate cuts probably in the third quarter. So that's the monetary policy piece of the equation. The U.S. is yep. very resilient. It's not, not a secret. Uh, the rest of the world, not so much when you look at the fundamentals. What is driving this dollar move? Is it the monetary policy or is it capital flows? I think it's a bit of everything, basically. You so you've pick got. One. Come <laughs> on, Chris. Yeah. OK, sure. Uh, high yields, high liquidity, uh, the geopolitical risk kind of picking up and the US energy independence. So if you do see this energy shock coming out of the States, for example, any stress in the Straits for Hormuz and gas prices and oil prices surge higher, I think that would just send the dollar even higher. So, you know, you're talking about how it's the market kind of positioning for geopolitics. And I think, you know, if you sit in the dollar, very high yielding, 525 5.25% uh, like deposit rates, it's not a bad place to sit, you know, given the risks that we face at the moment. Do you, to be clear, on the, on the central banks then, you, you're pushing back on the, on the narrative that formed by, uh, by the end of last week, then actually there's real divergence going on between the likes of the Fed and the ECB. Mm. Do you push back on that with, with your expectation that there are actually three cuts coming through from the Fed? And what does that mean for euro dollar? Yeah, we think there's probably going to be more story for Q3. I think in Q2, I think divergence, as you say, will be the hot story. Um, 
you know, it's uh, very kind of clear the ECB is saying we've got a different kind of inflation in the Eurozone. We've had a supply shocks. So we don't have the same demand-driven inflation that they do in the States. We've got room to cut, and we're prepared to be independent. So I think that story might last for the next couple of months or so. Eurodollar could, which is now close to 107 today, could go to 105. But I think one of the reasons why those people are calling for parity, we're not in the parity camp, and we don't think it's going to stay in, down at parity, is the situation is far different from late 22, when we had much higher energy prices. Uh, the Eurozone current account deficit back then was minus 30 billion. It was a 30 billion deficit per month. Now you're looking at 30 billion surpluses. So this sort of brief period of like dollar strength or euro weakness just on the rate differential, I don't think it's a good quality story to kind of back for the rest of the year anyway. So we're looking for sort of temporary dollar strength just into, into Q3 and then that turning around. OK, 105 on euro dollar. What do you do with the pound? The pound, I think it's interesting at the moment. Last week, you saw the market pricing 45 basis points for easing, both from the Bank of England and the Fed this year. I think that divergence will come through where the market prices the Bank of England more like the ECB than they do like the Fed. And we had some really interesting comments from Dave Ramsden on Friday, one of the insiders, saying actually things are heading the right direction direction. Disinflation is coming. Um, there may be some signals, you never know, at the May meeting about a June recut. We're actually going for August, but we think there are risks they go in June. So I think uh, greater pricing for Bank of England can see cable under pressure and sterling underperforming the euro. I look at the options market, I look at the yen, and oh my lord, is that a big position? It looks really stretched at the moment. Does it get more stretched? And when it snaps, what happens? Yeah, so we're up at a big level in uh, dollar yen near kind of 155. And we're talking about with our traders last week, you know, if you do, for example, this Friday, you have a core PCE at 0.4, another really sort of strong US piece of price data, dollar yen surges through 155. Can the Bank of Japan really say, you know, we've got a problem with this? It's a, a sort of macro driven yep. move. But I think last week, and uh, I wanted to, to kind of talk about this, we had this um, a trilateral meeting of finance ministers in Korea, Japan and the US. There was a joint press release. And the Japanese and Koreans said we've got serious concerns about the sharp depreciation on our currencies. So I think that does actually raise the risk that if the dollar does surge and we see some disorderly moves in dollar yen and dollar Korea above 155 and 1400 respectively, that you actually could see some coordinated intervention between uh, Japan and Korea. Um, I think it was Connolly that said it's our currency and it's your problem. <laughs> Back in 1971. Yeah. There's an echo coming, it seems, certainly right yeah. now. How, how successful would intervention be? Um, are the conditions right for intervention? You, you need to make sure the market is all one way. You need to deliver a surprise. Is that surprise in place? Could a surprise actually come in terms of the hawkishness of the BOJ and the mm. message that it delivers as well? How does this mm. play out? Is the risk yeah. intervention? Is the risk, is the risk hawkishness? Mm. Um, and, and, and are the, are the markets... It, it, does market positioning kind of lean one way or the other in terms of which one would be more effective? Yeah. I think for a sustainable turn in the dollar, you've really got to see the the US macro story changing. Okay. I think some modest increases. We actually do think the Bank of Japan can hike twice, I think July and October. But as we saw after uh, the last kind of Bank of Japan hike, the fact that the spreads are so wide that some modest 25 basis point narrowing policy spread, and actually JGB Treasury spreads have continued to widen, uh, any turn into the end won't be driven by the Bank of Japan. It would have to be the US. So I think uh, most probably the, the Japanese will hope they can uh, inject a bit of uncertainty. You know, if you were thinking about selling the yen or the Korean one, you know, you may want to think twice if those guys were going to come in and, and sell a lot of dollars and you don't quite know yeah. where. But really the big turn will only be when the macro story shifts. And importantly, if you remember last November and December, when the yep. dollar turned on the sort of Fed easing story, actually it was the yen that outperformed and it's the yen that is the most undervalued currency in the G10. So I think when the market does decide that the dollar has turned, actually the yen will be quite a popular currency to, to trade that story. So if everything seems to be a function of the dollar at the end of the day, where does election risk fall into this? Where does deficit risk fall into all of this? Yeah, I think deficit risk, uh, if you looked at the FX markets over the last kind of decade, it, there have been very rare occasions where, you know, treasuries and the dollar have sold off kind of hand in hand. So, and there have been occasionally sort of poor auctions, large tails and, you know, maybe sort of a 12-hour or three-hour move in the dollar that gets quickly kind of reversed. So maybe that will be a story for, um, you know, next year once we know kind of who's, who's in the White House. But I think at the moment investors are... 
I think they're not making up their minds about this. You see in the options market there are kinks in the options curves. They expect more yep. volatility after November, but positioning for that now, I think it's too early. And I think you know, probably it will only be after the Labor Day holiday when we start looking at the polls, and I think the consensus will be Donald Trump uh, would see a stronger dollar and, and Biden a softer dollar. OK, we'll wait. We'll see how that positioning unfolds. Chris, lovely to see you this morning. Thank you for stopping by to see us. Chris Turner, Global Head of Markets at ING. Coming up, we're going to take a look at which stocks you want to be watching into the open, including UK music investor uh, Hypnosis. After the private equity firm Blackstone made a new proposal to buy the company, we're going to keep an eye on what is happening there. Big week for earnings coming up. SAP is going to report a little bit later today. Uh, this is Bloomberg. Fifteen minutes to go until XG start trading here in Europe. I'm rubbing my hands together because it's going to be quite the session, quite the week. Uh, it is Passover, so you may see some light volume uh, when it comes to the United States a little bit later on. But futures at the moment, following the big sell-off we saw Friday, we are seeing a positive picture emerging this morning. Does that continue? For how long does that continue? And what could change the narrative this week? Because there are so many things. You've got earnings. You've got a lot of supply. Notes in the States. Uh, you've got central bank meetings. You've got a lot of central bank speak. There is a lot going on. I'm going to fold some <laughs> geopolitics into all of this as well. Let's try and figure out exactly what is going to move markets this week. Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Markets, Paul Dobson, joins us now to discuss. Paul, what do you got your eye on? Uh, well, uh, as, as you said, Guy, uh, a bit of a gentle start to the week, uh, a little bit more uh, calm out there. We've seen a drop off in oil prices. We're seeing U.S. futures up a little bit uh, and uh, some easing back again on Treasury. So kind of a risk on risk off dynamic is still playing out in markets. We're risk on today. I think this week, um, what we're really going to be looking forward to is, of course, the earnings, but not only, I think, for their impact on what uh, U.S. equities look like, but also for the uh, rates outlook in the U.S. Given the strength of the economy that we've seen, uh, people are wondering, are the companies going to be reflecting that in their earnings? And if they are, you know, does that just give us one more kind of like sign uh, of the of the strength of the economy and the reason and one more reason for the Fed to either keep interest rates higher for longer or to start talking a little bit more aggressively uh, going on from here about the possibility of a hike rather than a cut. That's the market's big concern. And that's really creating that blowback for the rest of the world via the channel of a stronger dollar. Get inflation data Friday. That's going to be a fact that we need to to roll into this as well. We get quite a lot of PMI data as well this week. Is the macro story going to have an impact here too? Yeah, I think I think definitely uh, that's all playing around in the backdrop. I think what we also learned last week is that some of the market's frailties and weak spots are actually a little bit closer to the service than maybe we'd anticipated. And that's what we got certainly across Asia with a number of the currencies hitting uh, uh, multi-year lows uh, during trading sessions, the central banks ratcheting up their fight back as well. And then even that kind of mini flash crash that we saw in the Mexican peso. Yes, by the end of the day on Friday, everything was back to where it had started. But in the meantime, a 5% swing one way and then the other gives you a sense that kind of there's a little bit of concern out there. There's not all the mo that much liquidity and safety net as you might have expected. So I feel like it's going to be interesting to see how that volatility uh, plays out and how that reflects in the rest of the uh, market and price action this week. I love that you brought up the Mexican peso. I myself uh, love talking about it. We don't often talk about it enough in this region. Paul, don't go anywhere. Uh, we want to come right back to you, but I want to bring something to our kind of viewership's attention here because at the core of even the flash crash that you were just talking about or even the BOJ this week is going to be the currency story. We just had Chris Turner over at ING talk to us about that dollar positioning here. And I want to bring this kind of a full screen quotes, commentary from around the world to everyone's attention because dollar strength has been positioned for, for a while. People have been long dollar for a little bit while. They've been ramping up those bets after this conversation coming out of the Federal Reserve. The concern here is exactly what Guy referenced, the idea that it's our currency, your problem, seems to be the message out of the states. And you're hearing that from the BOJ, the Bank of Korea, the Bank of Vietnam, even Christine Lagarde over at the ECB talking about what those currency ramifications may actually look like. Paul, come back in here and, and walk us through how big of a danger this really is when we're talking about currency intervention, parity in Europe. What is your take in terms of the risk these dollar longs are posing? 
Yeah, so I think that I think that it is uh, toxic for a lot of Asia's financial markets and that, that, that put the same respect for, for Europe, it's going to be painful if we think that the ECB is going to be moving ahead of the Fed or maybe even in a different direction to the Fed with uh, cuts in interest rates coming in the summer. Then that, you know, really could put the euro under a lot of pressure. People are looking to 105, but they're also looking to parity. And even beyond that, you know, if, if the pressure really comes and while, uh, you know, that that may uh, be beneficial for exporters, it's not going to help. Uh, the central banks as they're trying to bring down that inflation uh, if you suddenly have a much weaker currency. So probably an undesirable side effect. And and I think it was really telling the way that the IMF and G20 meetings went last week where we went into it expecting it to be all about China, but we came away from it all about the criticism of the US running too um, expansionary uh, 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 fiscal policy and how that's causing headaches for everybody else. Paul, let's, let's uh, hover on that a little bit, the, the China-US linkages when it comes to uh, monetary policy. There's a constraint, isn't there, for the, for the PBOC and the finance ministry to push through with, with further easing um, when rates are high in the US and, and the dollar strength is there. Um, is, that, is that a growth headwind for China? Are we underestimating the impacts on China from, from strong dollar? Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely painful, right? The PBOC can't um, <coughs> allow the currency to weaken too much because it's worried that that will spur a massive capital outflow. But at the same time, by following the dollar, which it's doing at the moment, it's strengthening the yuan against all of its other trading uh, partners around the region. Also, you know, China went to the, the IMF meeting and they said, hey, you know, like, why are you so worried about our exports? You know, we're giving you cheap goods around the world. We're fighting your inflation problem for you. But of course, that's not the way that the rest of the world, particularly the US and Europe, is seeing it when they're seeing all of these Chinese electric vehicles, uh, renewable energy equipment coming into the market and undercutting their own producers uh, or manufacturers, then that's being seen more as a geopolitical threat or something like that. And so, um, you know, there's all of these uh, politics playing into it alongside uh, the actual market risks and what that's doing to the various economies. Paul, just to wrap it all up, in terms of the key things, you got kind of the milestones you've got to watch out for this week. You've got Magnificent Seven, a whole bunch of them reporting numbers. You've got some European banks coming out. We've obviously got a big focus on what's happening with the currency and the BOJ2 in there. In terms of how you're thinking about how the arc of this week is going to work, what are you kind of setting us up for? How are you looking at this week in terms of kind of is momentum going to build towards the end of this week? Are we going to get another kind of Friday crescendo? What are you thinking about the arc looks, how the arc looks? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty worrying. You know, I'm kind of not planning too far in advance, just in case we get more of that volatility and we could get the, the geopolitics wild cards as well. I think a 10% drop in NVIDIA <clears throat> on Friday uh, in the afternoon, you know, kind of getting ready for these earnings is pretty uh, worrying. Again, another sign of that sort of liquidity situation kind of being a little bit questionable right now. But it does set us up for the possibility of a big rally if the earnings do deliver across the Magnificent Seven this week. And then, you know, like I was saying, if that inflates the, the dollar, it's going to put the yen under all sorts of pressure as we get to the, uh, the Bank of Japan's policy decision on Friday our time. OK, Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Markets, Paul Dobson, thank you very much indeed. Let's switch focus now and bring in Joe Easton from our equities team. Not switch focus, but dig deeper on individual stocks and focus. Joe, what are you looking at? Morning, Tom. So we've got an eye on a couple of the utility stocks here in Europe today after news late on Friday that New York has cancelled a swathe of contracts related to the offshore wind sector. Now, this is due to a lack of turbines that were produced by a smaller US company, according to the New York State. On Friday, Morgan Stanley today predicting a negative reaction in RWE over in Germany, given they were one of the big contractors there, and also warning that they could be a read across for Orsted over in Denmark as well, given it's another firm that does provide offshore wind to the New York State. Now, here's RWE. We can already see it's having a bad run over the past year as some of their power prices do decline down around 20% over the past year. But if we look at the analyst makeup screen, it's a very positive one. Almost a clean sweep on that one. 23 buys, two holds, not a single sell. Potentially some of those analysts might be caught off guard by this news today. Then we're also looking at the music space once again. We've got a bidding war for Hypnosis Songs Fund, the UK royalty investor that we covered last week following a takeover bid. And Blackstone is coming in over the weekend with a rival offer for the firm. Now, they are offering $1.5 billion, which does top the bid made by Concord last week that we covered on the show. The price is $1.24 per share, almost 7% higher. And as such, 
Hypnosis does intend to recommend that bid should a firm offer come through. As a reminder, Hypnosis owns songs done by Blondie, Neil Young, all those classics that we all love. But if we look at a longer-term chart on this one, it has had a bit of a volatile time. We saw, actually, Blackstone attempt to buy some of their catalogue a few months ago. Then there was an issue with the valuation of some of their music royalties. There was a review into that. It wasn't as much as they expected. But as such, we are seeing a couple of takeover bids potentially trying to capitalise on that reduced valuation there. Finally, we're looking at UK retailers. Jefferies turning much more positive on the sector today. They are citing a potential rebound in disposable income among Britons. They say that as energy prices come down, wages are going to remain elevated and that should feed into the UK retail market. There's also a competitive environment in terms of groceries which should benefit volumes the lag that they see though is over in diy they say the macro improvement won't be reflected in diy for a while so they're not positive on everything they have a hold on bnm and a couple of sell ratings but these three sainsbury's marks and spencer's next all come up to buy this morning and we could potentially therefore see a boost in those stocks this morning. The UK retail index still trading at a bit of a low following the slump that we've seen over the past couple of years. But those three shares could get a boost this morning. Equities reporter Joe Easton, thank you very much indeed. A European futures pointing higher by a little over six tenths of a percent. The market open thank you. is next. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Markets Today. A few minutes to go until the start of cash equity trading. You're seeing futures actually substantially higher, higher by about seven tenths of one percent on the euro stocks. Fifty, let's see, one hundred, one point two percent higher in futures. What happened to the catch-up trade from Friday, or do you think that Friday was more of a? de-risking, and now people are piling in ahead of that earnings story. How are we interpreting this? It was very tech-heavy, wasn't it? Yeah. Not a lot of tech on the FTSE 100. There's true. a little bit, but there's not a lot. True, true. So maybe that's the factor that we're watching here. Plus, also, U.S. futures are quite positive this morning. Yeah. So maybe that's the... Well, maybe only about half it. a percent. The FTSE 100 has almost doubled that. Uh, yeah. Do you think but, it's a liquidity but, story But no well. tech, I, I think... Could be, could be the story. And, and interesting, that there's a lot of upgrades in terms of what we're seeing uh, in terms of the retailers this morning. Yeah. I'm also going to flag, I was reading a short note earlier, Gem Diamonds recovering 169 carat type 2 white diamond over the last recovering. few years. Recovering? What is it? They, well, dug it out of the ground. They literally dug out 169. They didn't lose it. <laughs> didn't lose it. Now, we found it. It's down the back of the sofa. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so apparently that could be a stock to watch, but it, but it just kind of reinforces the mining story. So I think there's a, there's a, a sort of big mining element. But yeah, I don't, Europe doesn't have the tech story, but SAP does report tonight. Yeah. And it's going to be really interesting to see how European tech fares in this kind of environment and what numbers they are going to produce. Yeah, so SAP in focus. They're here and there as well. It's just interesting in terms of the futures flagging upside for the FTSE 100 because commodities are softer in the session. Oil by quite a lot, yep. um, down by 1.4%. Um, but copper's, we, copper's been pushing higher. But copper, copper's a little higher. Iron ore's a little softer. Copper's a little yeah. softer right now. But yes, that upside has come through from copper. And Rita Sen telling us she's around $85 a barrel uh, on oil. So we're expecting a positive performance, much to the annoyance of Kriti Gupta this morning out of uh, European markets. But it does look like uh, the US is going to bounce back. But today feels a little quieter. We often say this on a Monday. Rest of the week, though, I think could be quite the week. Yeah. Um, we are going to see an awful lot of earnings coming through. The European banks are going to be fascinating. Big tech, uh, obviously a very big focus. You know, for me, it's all about the consumer. Nestle, Unilever, those are yeah. the questions I have. There's a headline coming out uh, this morning around Unilever that they may struggle to find a buyer for their ice cream business. You, I'd you like to put my hand this. up. <laughs> yes, I'd like to put my hand up as, as an ice cream fanatic. Uh, but that's going to be an interesting one as well because I'm curious about the price hikes there. I'm curious about the supply chain issues there. Um, I believe they're reporting, I want to say Wednesday um, or they, Thursday, so maybe. They've been, they've been real underperformers. They have. So this whole sector has been, has been a, a, an area but of... But you make the point as well. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. Well, I'm, I, if I'm making a good point, I'm willing to hear you talk about it. I, I, <laughs> I will make an exception on, 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 on the Guy Johnson kind of um, uh, yep. flack train. But you made a really good point about it being a potential inflation hedge, that if you're concerned about this, then do you hop back into not only the commodity names, but the yep. consumer names 
as well. Could help the top line. Actually, to Tom's point, the miners are softer this morning. That's the only area in which we're seeing significant softness this morning. Uh, Rio's down, Glencore's down. What is up, though, are, in terms of the points, HSBC, mm. Shell, AstraZeneca, Unilever, GSK. So it's kind of the other side of the fence in terms of what's happening. Banks and drug stocks. Unilever up by 1.21%. Mm, interesting. Happy. Yeah, so we, we, we keep, <laughs> keep across that one in the ice cream story around Unilever. As you say, they've had that restructuring challenge, haven't they? Uh, and the softness that's come through more broadly for that, for that stock. Um, the bank, we talk about the bank earnings out of Europe, um, the investment banking part of the business. You flagged this guy um, prior to uh, the, uh, the open around Deutsche Bank and others within that space, the French lenders as well, in terms of whether or not the pickup in some of those deals is going gonna, is gonna to really start to like, come through in a significant way for some of the European banks. And how How's the trading? What's the trading story going to look like as well? I think mm. it's going to be interesting. Um, after we saw that Goldman Sachs sort of blowout number, it did so well. It's also worth flagging this morning, and this is something that Bloomberg's reporting obviously front ran. The SNB, the Swiss National Bank, is going to raise the minimum requirement for banks in Switzerland. It's a fairly chunky increase as well, but to a certain extent, I suspect that that has largely been priced in uh, as a result of the, uh, the story that Bloomberg wrote a couple of days ago. Um, let's talk a little bit about what the rest of the week is going to look like. Let's talk about what the earnings story is going to look like as well uh, and how this market is, is going to set up. The, the growth story, obviously, is the backdrop to all of this. And th there's a lot of macro data out this week and there's a lot of corporate earnings this week. Uh, and it's going to be really interesting to see kind of which one of these two factors ultimately ends up being probably the biggest factor for markets. On Friday, uh, we spoke to Scarlett Montgomery Kerning about all of this. We're getting more optimistic on global growth. We're definitely seeing a bottoming in Chinese data. And that's meant that there's been a broadening of the rally. And you've actually seen U.S. equities underperform or perform more in line with other markets. And equities in particular, what you've seen is that there's been that broadening in Europe. And European tech has done quite well as well. The other thing is the cuts. It's certainly that we've had stagnation this year. The ECB is tight. And so you need cuts this year to see a rebound in growth in Europe for 2025. Okay, T.S. Lombard, Skylet Montgomery Coning speaking to this program on Friday. Joining us now, very pleased to say, is Helen Jewell, CIO, Premier for Fundamental Equities at BlackRock. Um, the sell-off on Friday, we're seeing a little bit of upside coming through in European stocks, futures in the U.S. pointing positive as well. Would you lean into that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the pullback that we've seen, and I think we were all expecting it, that the market was expecting a bit of a pullback. Markets don't go up in straight Is that lines. a healthy, healthy correction we've seen or just a, a, a healthy pullback? I How would you characterise it? a little bit bigger than maybe we would have expected and liked. And there's a few factors for that. You know, geopolitical risks have been a little bit higher. And the second, of course, is the big interest rate story. Interest rates are, are definitely proving a little bit stickier, inflation a bit stickier in interest rates than we might have expected. So the pullback has been a little bit sharper than, than maybe it might have been, but a pullback is entirely expected, uh, given the levels that we got to at the end of, of that first quarter. So absolutely, this does feel like a bit of a, a buy-the-dip kind of rally uh, rather than, than the sell-the-rally uh, kind of market. Can equity markets rally if central banks keep rates higher for longer? Can they look through that, Helen? Yeah, I absolutely think that they can. So... Interest rates are important, but at this level, equities can still perform well. But there are things we continue to need to focus on. The first is those two tail risks. And, and the tail risks, last time I was here, they felt pretty small. They, they definitely feel a bit bigger. The tail risk of inflation being sticky and the potential of rate hikes. And secondly, that recessionary concern, although that one is probably the one that has shrunk a little bit. The key thing, and I know you've talked about it already this morning, is these earnings numbers. The earnings numbers do need to come through. And what we're seeing, interestingly, we saw it a bit last week in some of the European chip names, is when there is anything that is conceived as anything like not perfect, even if the, the earnings look strong, the revenue isn't perfect, that the guidance is a little bit more cautious, you are seeing quite a big pullback. And this week, as you've already said, some big names reporting. So for me, it's those earnings numbers that have become almost more important than, than anything from a macro perspective, which is an interesting market. How asymmetric is the position we now find ourselves in, though? How hard is it going to be to make upside gains from here, given the fact that the tails are getting bigger? And therefore, is the bigger risk, the kind of, is the asymmetry lies at the downside? And that's where maybe you want to be hedging maybe some of that downside risk as well. And if you are going to be hedging it, how do you do it? Yeah, no, I, I do think there is a bit more of an asymmetric risk. Again, if you take the first quarter, I think 7% for, for, for the uh, stocks, it was never about multiplying that by four. It's more like where we are now. So a much more steady market is what I think most of us would predict 
for the end of the year versus what we saw in that incredible first quarter. How do you hedge it? Uh, a little bit of the defensives and the quality defensives. Again, if you look at the names that are doing well already today, yep. these are quality defensive names. And, and that's a kind of good hedge to play. The other one that's really exciting for me as a, a Serie responsible, uh, responsible for Europe is the European names. This really, really could be an interesting time for these names. The broadening of the market, much more relevant in Europe. The valuation gap, which is now at 40% versus a more traditional 2025, could be interesting. And if the ECB does cut before the Fed, which is now basically what's being built into consensus, could also give us a bit of a pivot for the small caps. The argument recently about buying Europe has been the US is so expensive, you want to look elsewhere. If the US becomes less expensive, why do I look elsewhere? I'm not sure that is the only argument for Europe. The, the other big argument for Europe is the breadth of the market. It, it is much more broad in terms of where you find those quality winners. And I think that that is going to be a much more interesting play. And, of course, the interest rates. Now, whilst I say that interest rates long term can stay where they are, there is no doubt that if and when interest rates do cut, that is going to give a boost to that market. So, so that's another thing. The US dollar, you know, we've talked about the yep. strength in the US dollar, generally not good for equity markets as a whole. But for multinationals in Europe, a, a strong US dollar isn't a bad thing. So there's a lot to play and a lot to be interested in in Europe. I don't think it's just about the valuations, albeit, Guy, the valuations, of course, are one of the factors. So if we're talking about that broadening out in Europe, do European investors, investors in Europe, need to be concerned about the mini correction you're seeing in the States in terms of it being tech led? Is there a bigger, more magnified read through into Europe or is that minimized when it comes to the kind of the cross Atlantic trade? I think there is going to be a read through. I mean, I think this goes back to this week, some really important earnings numbers coming out, particularly in some of those bigger, really important parts of the, the Mag 7. If they miss, there is going to be a read across globally. There, there is no doubt about that. So there is going to be read across, but the read across is much, much smaller in terms of the implications for the European market. You're not going to feel it in some of the industrials names that have done very well, some of the A&D names, aerospace state names that have done very well. So the read across is much more muted, but I'm not going to say that there won't be one. Of course there will. And I think we're all very, very focused and hoping that those numbers do do well. Yeah. So that's going to be a key focus this, this year. This Can we talk year. about these bank stocks as well? We've got three big ones on Thursday itself, Deutsche Bank, BMP, and then Barclays as well. Is the story there still buybacks, which I think is what we talked about the last time you were here, or is the story peak net, net interest income? So I think it's both of those, but also a third factor, which is the strategy of these banks going forward. I think what's very interesting, particularly in some of those larger banks, the acquisitions they're making, how long those acquisitions are going to be to, to play out, that's a really interesting story for us. There's been some pullbacks in, in some of the larger names that we're leaning into. But that is much more specific for particular names. There is some dispersion between different countries, the structure of the different countries and the banks as a structure in those countries. So I don't think it is any one thing. I think it's a combination of all of those things and selectivity within those banks, which have got the good long-term strategy to play into, which are in markets that are just a little bit less competitive, and the buyback story that we continue to talk about and continues to be really, really important for investors. Um, what do you do with energy, with energy companies in Europe? Is that part of the valuation, the valuation call? Is that the, is that the appeal? And, and what is the time frame that you want to be getting exposure to some of those, those energy majors? So the energy majors are very interesting. Obviously, the, the oil price has had a really good run year to date, a little bit of a, a pullback, but mainly because, again, it, it was probably overdue a bit of a pullback. The energy majors in Europe provide a really interesting valuation play in that value part of the market. And I do think you need to buy. And actually, I think it can be a little bit more of a tactical purchase. If you look at the valuation levels, it is a really nice way to balance the portfolio, to your point, Guy, to make it a little bit mm. more barbelled. They are a really interesting place. They don't look expensive. They have very, very good yields. So a different way of returning capital to shareholders. It feels like the risk in those, you know, we all talk about the oil price being in a range. I think, if anything, again, the risk to the oil price is on the upside rather than on the downside. And therefore, it feels like, dare I say it, a relatively safe play to create a little bit of balance within a portfolio. So short term tactical, I would say, go for it. If the market feels asymmetric and I'm looking for safety, why am I buying equities at the moment? <laughs> am I buying equities? What? Am I buying equities for that dividend yield? Am I buying equities for income? Am I looking for the more bond-like stocks? 
Is, is, the, is the way I think about equities beginning to evolve? You talked about the beginning of the year. That was a, that was a capital appreciation story. I, the, 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 I'm looking at share prices going up. Am I still looking at share prices going up, or am I buying stocks for, for something else, that, that return of money in various different forms? Yeah, I mean, the re first reason you're buying stocks is that classic line. It's, it's time in the market versus timing of the market. If we could all get it perfectly yeah. right, maybe today would be a yeah. day to be a bit more cautious. But the second thing is this move much more into, and of course for me, I'm a little bit biased, into the more selective, active part of the market. Where are you seeing those quality names? Where are you seeing the opportunity in some of those small cap names that will respond well when those interest rates do come yeah. and, and get cut? I think the selectivity is, is the key. You're buying small caps in Europe? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It needs the interest rate selectively go. Yeah. It needs the interest rate cut to be the catalyst. And we did think that that would come sooner. So perhaps we went into small caps a little bit earlier than, than maybe would have been the right thing to do if you had perfect foresight. But some of those small caps are so cheaply valued. And they're valued at still recessionary rates. So if those interest rates were cut, and I think it's a, a, a when rather than an if, really interesting valuation opportunities there. So we've seen a lot more of our portfolios broadening out, both in terms of the sectors and in terms of the cap. So absolutely. When does the correlation between bonds and stocks turn positive? <laughs> uh, well, this is uh, slightly outside of my area of expertise, but I think when those interest rates do start to move, I think we all kind of feel like we've been in a holding pattern right now. Equities do perform well, as I say, at these level of rates, but we're all kind of waiting. Who will move first and when will they move? Will the Fed go before the U.S. election? Will the yeah. ECB move or are they going to be too concerned about the FX implications if they go too early versus the Fed? So... I think we're in a bit of a holding pattern at the moment. When that starts to normalise and we kind of break out of that holding pattern, I would say that that's maybe when we get to a more normal correlation. But it's not an area that I, ha I have expertise in, so that's one I'm very happy to hold my hands up and say I, I may be calling that wrong. We'll see what happens. Maybe you'll be right. Yeah, I hope you never, so. You never know. <laughs> Helen, nice to see you. Helen Jules, Likewise, CIO thank you. Uh, EMEA for Fundamental Equities at BlackRock. Thank you very much indeed. Quick look at what's happening with the Core 6 this morning, uh, just to see what the, kind of the, the core of the European equity market looks like. A couple of things that are probably worth noting. Ferrari's up. I think it's gone ex-dividend this morning, which I think probably means that that's a, uh, a fairly strong performance that we're seeing. Nestle has also gone XD this morning, so just be aware of that. Novo's a little bit soft. ASML, fairly flat, but LVMH is where the gains are really coming through. Uh, but there are, I think, 13, 13 major XD stocks that you want to watch out for in Europe this morning as you look at your screens. Uh, just bear that in mind. Let's get some of the other individual movers that we're watching. Joe Easton, over to you. So one area clearly in the green this morning is the airlines. Now, this looks look, due to the oil price declining, as Helen was discussing there, oil coming off a bit, down around 1% at the moment. We're seeing that feed through into the airlines, given the expected decline in fuel prices maybe in the near term. We did have that report from EasyJet last week, really strong bookings, and we'll get more reports out of the sector over the next few weeks. And we're seeing TUI, IAG, Air France, Lufthansa all higher this morning. Then we'll check in on a couple of those deals headlines that we had out this morning. There's a few moving today. Hypnosis up another 9%. The royalty, the music royalty firm getting a second bid. This one coming from Blackstone. A rival bid higher than, one, uh, higher than the one agreed last week. And we're also seeing Alstom doing a bit of a deal. Offloading a unit. This is the train company's signalling business over in North America. They're selling that. That was reported over the weekend and it is getting a boost. Another massive mover though in the UK. Time and this is in the construction space. It's UK mid-caps. They make sealants into the building sector. Getting a takeover bid today. Up 25% for that one in London. And and over in video games, Embracer in Sweden announcing that it's going to divide itself up into several different businesses. And investors liking that news today. That one's gaining 18% in Stockholm. Lots going on in terms of the deals today. In terms of the home builders, we did get overnight. We got some data out of the UK right move saying that house prices up around 1% in the last month. And that is feeding through into some of the builders today. Berkeley, Taylor, Wimpy, Barrett, Persim and all of those getting a boost. There is a, st a story on the terminal, however, though, about how it's still a difficult time for first-time buyers, so not all positive on there at the moment, but that is a boost this morning. RWE had a very small move lower following news of New York cancelling some of those offshore wind projects due to a lack of turbines. That one was down 1% at the open, but it's coming back up slightly, down 0.1% at the moment over in Germany. Then we got a couple of ratings changes. We did Next and the UK retailers over 
in stocks to watch earlier. That one getting a boost up 2%. Jeffrey says the outlook is improving as wages stay high, energy prices come down, and that benefits disposable income and spending. But another big one is UBS. It's downgraded today over at Exane, BNP Paribas. They downgrade it on capital concerns. You'll remember a story a few weeks ago about UBS potentially needing 25 billion euros worth of capital. And Exane says they agree with that and say it's not priced into the shares on terms of UBS share price. And that one is down 0.9%. Exane cuts it from outperform to neutral this morning. Joe Easton from my Exit team, running through some of the stocks on the move for us. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up, it is, of course, a big week for European earnings. We've been talking to Alan Jewell about the implications and what to look for. We're going to get ahead and a bit more of a deep dive in terms of the preview around the European bank results as well. Expected, of course, later in the week. What to scrutinise with those earnings? That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Uh, European equity market is off to a strong, strong start 20 minutes into the session. Friday feels like a distant memory, doesn't it? Uh, as you can see, some decent numbers being posted on the screen right now. Um, it could all change. It's a, it's a huge week in terms of the earnings picture, and, and a big part of that is going to be the banks that are going to report out of Europe. Some of the biggest names are going to be picking up the bat on this week. Remember, we saw a mixed set of numbers and a mixed reaction to what we saw on Wall Street. Bloomberg Intelligence is warning that with the sector trading near a six-year high, the outlook for lenders may be ripe for a little bit of a reset if, if earnings disappoint. So are earnings going to disappoint? What are we going to be watching out for? Thursday's a big day, but what are the key figures that we're going to be watching out for? Let's try and answer that question. Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf joins us now. Where's your attention going to be this week? It's Thursday, as you say, right? That is going to be huge. You've got Barclays reporting, BNP Paribas, and also Deutsche Bank. So probably three of the biggest European lenders, certainly the ones that, you know, with the big investment banks. So for me, on Thursday, I'm going to be looking at how those banks stack up against, you know, some of those US banks you mentioned. You know, you saw Goldman, you saw Morgan Stanley do pretty well on the capital market side. So can Barclays, Deutsche Bank in particular, replicate that? But, you know, it's pretty much end-to-end. -end. We've got retail banks reporting, NatWest Lloyd's coming out of the UK this week as well. So, yeah, it's going to be a busy one. On the retail banking side of things... What, what are you going to be scrutinising, Tom, Tom, you and the team, with that, with that particular lens on the UK then? Yeah, I think in the UK it's, it's all about, you know, a bit further along on the NAI story than continental rivals. So mm -hmm. for Lloyds and NatWest, it will really be, for me, are there any big provisions coming through? Is there any sign of distress? We're really not seeing that. That's very, very critical. Um, and also, I'll actually be kind of looking out for any kind of comments on, you know, individual industry things. So we've seen a lot of consolidation or announced consolidation in the UK. And, you know, Lloyds and NatWest not involved, but whether they guide on, are they interested in doing an M&A or are they sort of happy with their sort of offering? I think for me, those are the, the top things. What's the read through from the states here, especially when you're starting to see monetary policy at least expected to diverge between the ECB and the U.S.? What's the read through? Yeah, well, it was a sort of a mixed earnings uh, season over there, right? So for me, the, the big one on the Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley side is, is, is that investment banking sort of strength purely a U.S. story? Or can, you know, the Barclays and Deutsche Banks uh, do well there? And then it's, it's kind of tough. Like, J.P. Morgan disappointed slightly, but then you had Bank of America, Citigroup doing a bit better, perhaps, on the retail side. So, yeah, it's, it's really on the continental side, on the, you know, net interest income story, is how much do some of these European banks have left on that cycle? And, and it's a slightly complex picture. It's not like everyone's kind of going to be coming off it. I think you might see a few. Maybe the Nordic's doing pretty well still. But then maybe some of the bigger European banks saying, hey, we're, we're seeing the end of this sort of, sort of tailwind, as it were. What are they going to tell us about excess capital? How much they've got of it and how much they're going to be giving back of it? Well, buybacks and dividends, that's what really boosts the shares, right? So the last few quarters, we've seen banks like Unicredit really push that story. For me, the big thing is... Pretty smiling at me. I feel like I've stolen her question here. Every time guys <laughs> buy buybacks, I have to remind him that I said yeah. this three months ago. Continue. There you go. So, as Critty's been saying for months, um, <laughs> uh, no, exactly. it's just how much further can that actually go. So, you know, I think if they can come up with even more programmes, that'd be impressive. I think it's unlikely. But, um, you know, again, it comes back to sort of bank by bank level. Like, you know, you've seen some people be much more conservative than others. Yeah. 
uh, obviously the big changes in terms of the expectations around rates last week. Maybe, maybe we even start thinking about a hike uh, at some point. What, what does that mean for deal making? How should we be thinking about the higher rates, higher for longer, in terms of the deal making part of part of these businesses? Yeah, it, it probably doesn't necessarily help. But I mean, I get the sense that you know these rates have been high for so long, almost like people have started to adjust. So mm. I don't know if. You know, perhaps when we're talking about a few months and changes, I don't know how much that will change people's strategy. And the thing for me is really interesting is, you know, whether it's actually going to happen or not, picking up a lot of chatter about deals, right? It seems to be top of a lot of people's minds. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be these mega deals, but certainly maybe, you know, in, intramarket or something like that, there's, there's definitely appetite. And we're seeing it in the UK with, you know, a really interesting deal last week with Coventry and Co-op. This is kind of going back to the US read-through question, because over and over again, you have people saying, that, all right, well, if there's... Perhaps not as much kind of the trading momentum isn't boosting those earnings. Perhaps the capital markets activity will. Is the exposure to the U.S. then still where the growth in capital markets activity happens for the European banks? So, yeah, it's very interesting. Obviously, in Santander make a bit of a push in that within yeah. the sense of it being a global bank. You know, Barclays, the reason its investment bank is so large is because it does have that substantial U.S. presence. I mean, that's really where you want to be if you're looking to get the growth. Yeah. But, you know, it has been a slow market in Europe. And, and you know, I do have the sense that, you know, it's got to pick up on some extent. So uh, I wouldn't say it's essential, essential. But for, you know, to compete with, the, say, the JP Morgans, the Goldmans, you're going to need that. Can I just, can I just come back to the M&A comment you made just a moment ago between the banks? Banking deals don't usually get done in Europe unless there's a massive crisis. Yeah. Like we've seen that. UBS is obviously an example of that, but there are, there are plenty of others. But there's also this increasing chat of capital markets union becoming a greater reality. Banks usually prepare for kind of critical moments, crises moments, when they think deals could get done. Are you hearing chat that the, the banks are getting ready for that kind of a moment? And do you put the capital markets union stuff, kind of plug that into it as well? Is that, like, are we heading for a moment where actually Europe may start to consolidate in a big way? Well, certainly a lot of the big, big name executives would love that. And I, I think I wouldn't couch it as sort of within a crisis. What we're hearing is sort of European executives go, we've got to move beyond big mergers only happening during a crisis like UBS and Credit yeah. Suisse. In fact, they're saying, hey, we need to get the regulation in such a way that we can actually push through cross-border mergers for Europe because it's clearly needed, you know, uh, at least, you know, according to the executives. So I think that's probably what they're pushing for. But the message, as it's always been, is, look, we need to get those capital market reforms in place first. So that's why I'm not very optimistic. We will yes, see sir. some kind of huge yeah. cross-border deal. OK, Tom Metcalf, thank you very much indeed with a fantastic setup in terms of what to look for within the bank earnings story in Europe this week. And, of course, later in the week, you don't want to miss our interview with the CFOs of Deutsche Bank and BNP Paribas. So we'll be having those as well in the reaction. Stay with us for more. This is Bloomberg. I think that's Sean Fain. I think that's the UAW. I think that's the celebration that we saw this weekend in Chattanooga uh, as the VW plant there voted to join the UAW, the United Auto Workers. It's a landmark victory for the union uh, that has been organizing in a long, hostile U.S. South. What's next? Obviously, Tesla is on the, on the list. President Joe Biden congratulating employees, calling the vote historic. What does it mean for Volkswagen, I think, is another question that we need to ask. It has got a busy week. It's had to deal with that this weekend. Plus, also, it's got a capital markets day that is going to be taking place in China, China Day this week as well. Let's talk about the significance of the UAW vote, first of all. Oli Crook joining us from Berlin. Oli, how, how, what does this mean for VW? Yeah, so there's a lot of onlys here, right, in this story. And this is why it's so significant for VW and for the UAW. This is really the only major assembly plant that Volkswagen has in the United States. As you say, it's in Tennessee. It's got about 4,300 workers. So it's significant because it's also their EV hub for the United States and North America. And this is going to be their profit center going forward. And guess what? Their costs just went up, potentially, with this unionization. It's also the only UAW unionization shop of a foreign auto uh, company. So it's significant for that reason. And it's, only, it's also the only one to unionize in the South. All of this is part of Sean Fain's movement to try to bring this union back. 
In terms of what it means for the car companies, I mean, Guy, we talked about this, the sort of gap between um, the wages uh, between union and non-union workers is about a $5 gap. Um, overall, uh, that's just for the wages for benefits. It's about $11 gap. But we were talking about this when there was the big strike for the big three uh, at the end of last year. Pre-strike, Ford was paying about $64 an hour for labor, where the foreign automakers were paying just about $55. Tesla, that's about $45 to $50 an hour. So these are really significant gaps. And after they struck those deals, Guy, they had the Ford coming out saying that it's going to add $900 per car and shave about 70 basis points off of margins in an industry where they're really fighting for every single margin, uh, a basis point on the margin right now. Mm, so the impact is real. What is the broader context for VW specifically then, Ollie? Yeah, so we talk about the unions for Volkswagen. Obviously, this is a company that turns out more cars than almost any other company in the world, but you wouldn't know it by looking at their market cap because investors have really lost some confidence in partially their EV strategy, but also what's going on in China. The good news for Volkswagen is that they're used to dealing with unions. It's a major part of their uh, their association here in Germany. They hold a lot of the board seats. But when it comes to the sort of China story and how they're going to regain market share in China, I mean, you look at their numbers last year. They sold just about as many cars in China as they did in Europe. That is not a good omen for their growth market. And that puts the focus in terms of growth on the United States, where, again, you've just had a major development in their cost base in the United States. I mean, they only have about 4% of the market share in the United States. That's less than Tesla. So that is their potential growth area. And as we've been discussing, again, that just got a little bit tougher for them. Ali, this has been an issue for a lot of European companies. Stellantis, for example, notably saying that it ate into their bottom line. If we see more unionization in the States, which, by the way, the Biden administration is very much campaigning for, what is the read through? Yeah, so this is a major push for Sean Fain, the union boss, who probably no one had really heard about on the international stage until a couple months ago when he got that historic deal from the big three, about 25 percent on wages, 30 percent total for all the union workers in the U United States. And when you think about the unions, I mean, the UAW had about 1.5 million workers in, in the 1970s. It's down to less than 400,000. He has said he wants to get that number up by 150,000 workers. He's targeting about 16 companies. So really what we need to watch out for, all of these foreign automakers, whether it's Mercedes, BMW, Toyota, and of course also the, some of the domestic ones, Tesla is going to be in focus. But in terms of the next shoe to drop, Mercedes, they have, an, they have a, a, a production site, a plant in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and that is where they're going to have the next vote in the middle of May. So you could see this slowly coming to the fore. And again, as you mentioned, Creedy, this is something that Biden has been supportive. But guess what? Even candidate Trump has made a huge amount of noise about basically erecting trade barriers and trying to keep production in the United States, saying that even if if you're producing cars in Mexico, that's not going to be good enough to get them into the United States for free. And Ali, to your point, President Trump making a very big bid for the endorsement of Sean Fain, which, of course, he then lost to President Biden. We thank you so much, Bloomer's Oliver Cook. They're walking us through the implications of the union votes in the states and what that means, of course, for the European car makers. Let's stick with the story of car makers, though. Elon Musk has postponed a trip to India, blaming pressure, pressing issues, excuse me, at Tesla, which spent the weekend cutting prices for its cars and driver assistance software. This all ahead of earnings due out tomorrow. Due out tomorrow. I'm going to get my words right here. They are due out tomorrow. They are expected to confirm a first revenue decline in, get this, four years' time. Let's bring in Craig Trudell, our global autos editor. Craig, how much trouble is Tesla in? I, I think the fact that we're seeing such kind of, you know, rash moves uh, by Musk, I think it really speaks to this idea that, oh, no, the, things are, are not going well here. Uh, and we've seen in the past that when his back is up against the wall, things get really sort of hectic really fast. I think back to 2018 when he decided on a whim to tweet uh, that, you know, he had the funding secured to go private. Uh, we're, we're maybe not quite to that level yet, but we are sort of approaching that level of chaos just with the amount of, of change happening. Some of it, which is really unsettling folks within Tesla, uh, there's really concern about this idea that he's uh, going so far as to uh, put aside plans for a $25,000 car and sort of, you know, put it all on, on robo taxis, which he's been talking about for years, but which, you know, Tesla really hasn't made a whole lot of progress with standing up the infrastructure it needs to do that. Is that a bet the company type move? I, I, I listened to one of his uh, a podcasts recently. He was talk, he was on it uh, playing with the soundboard, um, and he was talking about bet the company <laughs> type moves. Is this yeah. a bet the company type move? And how do I see that if that's the case? Kind of versus the earnings that we're about to get. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I honestly, I think it is in, in the sense that, you know, if you think about what uh, a company like Waymo or Cruise has done, it, this is not a, a cheap endeavor. This is not something that you can sort of, uh, you know, yeah. uh, j just sort of make little bets here and there. You have to hire a whole lot of people. You have to set up infrastructure to, you know, let's let's say your car, uh, it, you know, gets uh, into a, a, a position where you need it to move out of the way for some sort of emergency uh, you know, I don't know that Tesla. It, yeah, I don't know that Tesla has you know remote operators or a system to set up you know to to handle that. We've seen that bedevil companies like Waymo and Cruise that have raised billions and billions of dollars, and even they have had challenges with that. And they're you know several years into testing these self-driving cars out on the road. So, so you got that, and then you got the earnings coming up. Can I ignore the earnings? Therefore, I, what are the <laughs> I, if we're if we're into this kind of stuff? What are the earnings going to really tell me about what's going on in this company? I think at this point, you, you almost sort of, you know, it's a given that the earnings are not going to be good, just based on the fact that yep. this company had really, really crummy first quarter deliveries. Nobody was expecting them to be this bad. I, I think the, the real concern for investors is, okay, so what's the plan? Are you really going to put this $25,000 car off? Are you really making this, you know, all in on robo-taxi bet? I think, you know, Musk has, has not been his, you know, his, he's been his own worst enemy in terms of not being clear on that and sort of giving people every indication that indeed he's willing to put this $25,000 car aside and really put it all on autonomy. Uh, you, you talk about the, the challenge around, around the deliveries and sales. Which part of the world is it? Because the cost cutting, it just kind of screams desperation at this point because it's not obviously the first time. They've had multiple price cuts and they seem to start in China and then roll them out to the U.S. and parts of Europe. Which part, which part of the world is looking most vulnerable to them? I think China is the most competitive and you hear Musk say that himself. I think that's where they brought prices down the most. I think it's also, in, in fairness, where they can afford to do, uh, you know, the, the steepest price cuts in the sense that their cost base there is the lowest that it is in, in the world. And yet, uh, I do think that this is part of why the, the robo-taxi pivot is so risky. Is we've seen these sort of uh, unintended effects of slashing the heck out of your prices. Uh, what it's done to a company like Hertz, you know, we, we saw uh, the CEO essentially lose his job over it. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that is not just something that, that affects, you know, big fleet companies. That also affects your customers. What do you feel if, if your, you know, Model Y that you purchased a year or two ago suddenly is worth, you know, 30% less than you thought it was going to be? You're not a, a, a particularly happy camper and, and perhaps not inclined to buy another Tesla. How do you disentangle the broader slowdown in the EV market from the idiosyncrasies of Tesla? It's a, it's a great question. I think, you know, the EV market in the U.S., it's, it's almost, you know, entirely been a Tesla story for years now. Uh, I, I think that's changing. I think Tesla is still very much in control of that market. Uh, Europe is, is much more competitive. China is even more competitive. Hmm. Uh, I do think that that's part of what's going on here, too, is that this is, has been a, a story about one company, and that is no longer the case. You have BYD really emerging in the last couple of years, and you have the, the uh, sort of legacy car makers having no choice but to take EVs seriously to try and come up with, you know, some semblance of the valuation that Musk has achieved the last few years. Well, the valuation is so interesting here because if I remember 2018, there was it took a while for Tesla, given its massive gains, to actually be included in the S&P 500 because of the volatility clause that was built into the way indexes are made. I'm not suggesting in any way that they're going to get booted from the index. That'd be insane. But I'm curious about the read through into the actual stock price here. Is this still a, a growing business that's getting more global? And is that how it's being viewed? Or are we starting to view it as kind of more fundamentally big tech and more established in that regard? I think we've seen the, the Wall Street analysts sort of slowly but surely come around to this idea of, oh, no, this growth company is no longer, uh, you know, it's, it's run out of growth. And yeah. I think there's a concern now about, you know, are vehicle sales actually going to drop this year? If they don't have a, a cheaper car on the way, uh, are they going to drop next year? You know, sort of where is the bottom? And, and people are really struggling to get a handle on that because the new product that they do have is a really difficult to make expensive pickup yeah. truck that is also very polarizing.
I mean, the irony of it all, and we just showed that chart on the air, and guys mentioned as well, is that Exxon is now a bigger market cap than Tesla, which, by the way, got booted from the Dow Jones uh, because it was considered kind of uh, one lost that much money, but also because it was kind of old oil. Craig Trudell, our global autos editor, walking us through a little bit of everything. We thank you so much. Coming up on the program, a $95 billion aid package with a little bit of a bolt-on piece as well, forcing TikTok's Chinese owner to divest its ownership. A lot of fast track to becoming law in the States. We're going to bring you the details next. This is Bloomberg. This is Marcus Today. We're about 45 minutes into the European trading day. Seeing green on the screen when you look at the equity markets. Is this a little bit of positioning ahead of the earnings story? That's something to be determined as we get through later this week. We've got big oil earnings in the States. We've got tech earnings, of course, bank earnings here as well, and, of course, the consumer. I'm really excited about Nestle and Unilever. That is just one thing on our docket all week long, as is the U.S. political story, which, by the way, is having ramifications for the rest of the world. I've been obsessed with this all weekend. It's how I spent my birthday. I watched the vote. $95 billion of aid going to Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel. And nestled into this national security package is sanctions on Iran, a potential divestiture for, for TikTok from ByteDance as well, and then what to do with those Russian frozen assets. Net-net, the biggest piece of this $95 billion has been $61 billion just towards Ukraine, replenishments in terms of defense. Already this morning, you're seeing a little bit of an uptick in uh, the Ukrainian bond story, their 2027 bond, rising the most in the EM universe this morning. Yeah, and, of course, and to be clear, to, to viewers who haven't been following it in, in, in a granular detail, the House had always been the problem, hadn't it? The Senate yeah. was going to pass it. They had their own plan for Ukraine. The, the president was always going to green light it. So we expect it to, to get to the president's desk by the end of this week and those fun flows and that military kit to, to get to Ukraine. So really, really interesting. And then there's the TikTok and the Iran parts. The TikTok part's interesting because the timing is as soon as Blinken goes to China, which yep. I believe the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has confirmed this morning, mm. April 24th through 26th. That'll be a fun discourse, I'm sure, as President Biden signs that into law. I, I just want to come back to, if you weren't watching at the beginning of the conversation, your view is that maybe the Chinese just go, we're not opening up the algorithm. There is legislation in China that yeah. permits, does not permit yeah. the algorithm maybe to open up to foreign eyes. Well, we'll get Alex Webb's take on this as well. Yeah. But my, I just have not seen in recent history examples of a, the, the Chinese, current Chinese government concerned about sacrificing one of their companies if it's in the interests of national security. And that's how they'd be looking yep. at it. They do have the laws in place domestically to ensure that you have to get permission if you open up an algorithm that was created in mainland China domestically. If that's what the US are calling for to, to be, have that comfort level, I don't see China relaxing on that or giving way on that. Things could change, but th that, that would be my take right now. Let's bring in Alex Webb then, who's got the details on this story around the TikTok, potential TikTok divestiture then. A bill forcing TikTok's Chinese owner ByteDance to divest its ownership is on a, a, a far, fast track, of course, as Critty was saying. Um, Alex, what do you take from, from what we've been hearing at, out of Washington and how significant this could be for TikTok? Have their efforts to lobby around this failed? W what is it looking like now in terms of the future for TikTok in the US? Yes, it, it certainly looks that way. We have we're in a similar situation maybe five years ago where it looked under like under the Trump administration, something might be pushed through. We saw a bunch of big tech companies, names like Oracle and Microsoft, sort of hovering around the prospect of being able to acquire TikTok from ByteDance, the parent company in China. It really doesn't look good for their ambitions to retain ownership of it. The, the bill has been, you know, as you say, has passed the House. It looks very likely that it's going to pass the Senate. And, you know, as you said, the president will sign it into law as soon as he can immediately after that. They then have a year to either divest or divest it or it'll be banned in the US. Now, they've said they will um, you know, take all legal recourse to try and prevent this. The question is whether that gives them a stay and actually the year starts again or whether that year will continue to progress. I think that will partly be down to the interpretation of the relevant judge. So. They are certainly on their kind of last legs in terms of trying to prevent this. So a ban is becoming more likely. Is Meta therefore the winner from this, Alex? It's, uh, Instagram generally has been the company that has benefited or is competing most keenly with TikTok. A little bit of YouTube as well. Don't forget YouTube also um, developed a product that is very uh, similar to TikTok. 
we also have to see who might acquire it. If it's a sale, uh, if it's uh, an IPO, you know, there are names out there who would like to have a piece of TikTok. Now, access to capital isn't quite as good as it was a good few years ago, uh, five years ago, as I said. So maybe there'll be less interest on that basis. But it is, you know, the fastest growing social media app out there. Anybody who maybe doesn't have a great social media business, Microsoft is one of those names, um, might therefore be interested in, in trying to get their paws on it. Um, Alex, talk to us about the secret source of TikTok then, which is, is this algorithm um, and, and the, the scrutiny that's coming under in the, in the US. If it gets divested, if another company comes and buys up TikTok for the US business and they don't have access to that algorithm, does it, is it still really TikTok? I mean, how, how are we thinking about that part of the story? Well, it's kind of unclear how the semantics of that would work. It looks as though, you know, previously they discussed you just have to license the algorithm, but you may not necessarily have the ability to look under the hood. Of course, the way that this thing works is you don't go in as you do with so many other apps. You know, if you get Spotify, for instance, it will ask you what music you are interested in, right? TikTok doesn't do that. It just starts serving you things and, you know, actually remarkably quickly manages to determine, to ascertain what the... Uh, fields are that you're interested in. And, and interestingly, and this is a little bit different from some of the other more established social media apps, it does regularly surface different types of content into your feed just to see, oh, are they going to nibble on that? Oh, they are, right? So that's the new field they might be interested in. That is a, a really interesting thing that has actually changed the dynamics of social media considerably because it doesn't matter to the same extent how many existing followers you have. Somebody can start from scratch today and be getting a million views on a video, but then the next video might only get 3,000. So it is, is a big change in, in the sort of economics of, of social media apps. How the licensing agreement might work, that's a detail that I'm yet to see any clarity on. Bloomberg's Alex Webb, we thank you so much for walking us through that. Uh, I think it's a really interesting dynamic when you look at kind of whether or not you even want exposure to this TikTok story, which brings me to a vital question. Do you have a TikTok? You know the answer to that question. <laughs> I, I had to say, do you even have a Facebook account? Do you, you know even the, know Facebook, what YouTube is? I'm aware of YouTube. YouTube's, <laughs> you, uh, YouTube, yes. Facebook, I... Uh, Okay, it's we're, been around for a while, let's put it that we're way. We're working on Guy is smashing technology. through social media barriers without TikTok. He's massive. You are and, on TikTok. And, and going viral as, as we speak. No, I have avoided, I've avoided TikTok. Yeah. I just I'm, the, the, the amount of attention I have, you know. So maybe I, I've been pushed by some to get on there. I feel like you would have a lot of good of a track record. But the reason I bring it up is because Alex was kind of mentioning this, who the main competitors are to your yep. question, meta, et cetera. If you actually look at Instagram, which, again, Guy does not have, uh, the, this is revenge, can, by the way. I totally am. I'm taking full advantage. But you can actually get TikTok videos on YouTube or TikTok videos on Instagram as well. So there's kind of this cannibalization anyway, as opposed to directly competing. I can see TikTok videos on yeah. my Instagram mm. feed. And I, I think that's an interesting dynamic in terms of is there kind of a, instead of a competitive end, is there a tailwind to it? D didn't Taylor Swift just put her music back on TikTok? Oh, I just, knew you would bring it there. Just to bring it back full circle. I'm not sure Enrique is going to be on there, but we can debate Enrique, that. Maybe. I'm Sorry, sure he Karen. would. Yeah. I, oh, my gosh. Off air. So mean. <laughs> What so goes mean. around comes around. It was Critty's birthday this weekend, but that has now passed. Um, OK, let's talk about another element of all of this story. As part of this package that we've seen coming out of the House uh, over the last couple of days, there is also uh, an element which includes new sanctions on Iran's oil sector. Paul Wallace joins us now to discuss this. Paul, how effective will this be? Hi, Guy. Well, if the U.S. implements these sanctions as they're put uh, on, on paper, then they could be pretty effective in curbing Iran's sort of more than one million barrels a day of, of crude exports. The issue is that the market clearly doesn't think that the White House will do that because it's intent on keeping oil prices down or at least steady. And I think that's one of the reasons why oil is is, uh, is lower today quite heavily. We're seeing Brent um, uh, close to $85 a barrel and WTI below $82 a barrel. Simply put, traders do not believe that the U.S. is going to do all that much um, to stop those Iranian barrels coming onto the market. Um, the U.S. Uh, president looks at gasoline prices, pump prices in America very, very closely. Uh, the last thing he wants with the November election looming is is higher prices um, at uh, at the pump. So that's uh, that's the big issue here. Just how hard will Joe Biden go in terms of enforcing these sanctions? Um, why hasn't the U.S. imposed 
sanctions properly, properly until there's been a lot of reports, haven't there, that, that basically the US eased back on, on implementing the sanctions that are already in place to try and ensure that prices didn't get too high on oil. Um, wh why, have they be, why have they taken that route? Why haven't they taken more action more quickly? What's been the thinking coming through from D.C.? Well, I think it's certainly the perception among most oil traders that the U.S. isn't doing all that much. That's what they've been arguing for a long time. And in, in their view, it's simply a case that the U.S. is nervous, or at least the, the White House and the Democrats are nervous about oil prices, pump prices uh, in the U.S. at least, going up uh, too, mu uh, too much. The U.S has always argued that it is enforcing its, its sanctions properly and it, it completely um, it pushes back against the notion that there's been any, um, uh, any sort of uh, deal in secret with the Iranians that it would go easy on sanctions in return for Iran. Um, uh, easing off what some of its proxies do in, in the region and, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think, to be fair to the U.S. government, it's extremely difficult to stop Iranian um, oil getting onto world markets. I mean, short of sending a big flot a naval flotilla uh, to the Persian Gulf or to the, yeah. um, uh, to, to the Arabian Sea and physically halting these ships, which would be pretty escalatory and very risky. Um, it's very difficult to do that. Some of these new sanctions seem uh, to allow the U.S. to yeah. target buyers more um, more effectively, and those are uh, teapots, as we call them, small refineries in China. Um, so there are a lot of moving parts here. Bloomers, Paul Wall is walking us through those sanctions implications. We thank you so much for, for that insight. And I think what's crucial is that last piece he said as well, is that there's a China component to oh, these yeah. Iranian sanctions as well, which I think is, again, why I'm so fascinated with this aid package. Yes, $95 billion is a lot, but it's the national security implications underneath targeting Iran, China, Russia. And we haven't really seen that priced into the market. It's not something people are really paying attention to. I wonder if that changes. Or is it because the markets realize that these sanctions are ineffective, largely, that history suggests that they've been effective. And China is the buyer when it comes yeah. to Iran. You just right? rewire the global economy, don't you? You're seeing it in metals because of Russia. You're seeing it with uh, oil mm -hmm. because of Russia. Uh, and and it, th that story continues. Blinken's going on Friday. I suspect he'll talk tough, but what impact that will actually have. Does this set the stage, though, for more election risk? Is this something that the markets pay more attention to in six months' time, 12 months' time, as opposed to right now? Uh, we're going to keep a very careful eye on the oil price. There's a big meeting mm -hmm. taking place in Rotterdam as well. Big conference taking place in Rotterdam today, so you may get some headlines out of that a little bit later on as well. Um, big week coming up. Uh, let's talk about what comes up next. The chairman of the luxury fashion house, Valentino, joining Francie. This is Bloomberg.